and welcome back to the Six Five Summit. I'm Shelley Kramer, one of the founding partners and a principal analyst here at Futurum Research. And on behalf of my team at Futurum and the team at More Insights and Strategy, welcome. We're glad to have you. In this spotlight session, Futurum's Daniel Newman is joined by Samantha Madrid, Juniper's Group Vice President, Connected Security Business and Strategy, to talk about all things cloud security and SASE, otherwise known as Secure Access Service Edge Architecture. Let's go hear what Samantha has to say. Samantha Madrid, welcome to the 65 Summit 2022. I am super excited to have you here. Thank you, Daniel. Really excited to be here. Thanks for including me. Yeah, it's, it, it's really great uh, this year that we were able to put extra emphasis on security if nothing else over the past two years, the world has become acutely aware of a few big technology topics, um, supply chain and the impact on semiconductors, yes. uh, just how important uh, the PC is to keeping our businesses running. And if by now they've not seen the light on security and, and you know hardening our enterprises and making sure our data is safe, I don't know that there will ever be a time that they, they, they will. What do you think about that? I think you're 100% right. It's a topic that I have daily with CISOs and CIOs about, you know, new architectures, the geopolitical dynamics that are happening. What does this mean? How do I evolve? What do I do? Absolutely spot on. Thank you. I was looking for that validation. That's exactly why I asked <laughs> you that question. Um, but it, it is super interesting because this has always been one of those topics. And you and I have talked before. You've come on some of my podcasts in the past, and we've had briefings and conversations. And We've always kind of talked about like, what is it going to take for companies to fully get it? Like, you know, for, and by the way, it's not always the people you're talking to, you know, I think the technologists do tend to understand it, but it's the budget approvers. It's the board and the governance of like, when, how, how bad does it have to get, you know, because it, the, the, it's that when if statement. So, you know, what I'd love to talk about starting off a little bit is, is the cloud and you know, you talk about all the conversations that you are having, Samantha, with the CISOs, with the CIOs. Um, we're seeing this huge migration. Again, you know, cloud is still pretty early days. We're really only at about a third of workloads, not even quite, uh, from the most recent research I've looked at. But we're seeing that migration happen. When you're having these conversations, how are you sort of enabling them to envision security evolving along with the architectures? Well, I think the operative word that you just said is evolve. And to me, evolve and evolution of any architecture, of any technology has to start with experience, right? I think where things fall down is we lose sight of the experience that we want our users to have. And so as a CIO, as a CISO, I need to be able to envision how do I want my business to operate? And, and from there, what and how do I want my us users to be a part of that? And so and everything so starts with the evolution. And, and for me, mm -hmm. I think where we've fallen down in the past as a technology, as an industry security specifically, is that we lose sight of that. And one of the things that we have at Juniper have been very laser focused on is that yes. of the experience and being experienced first. And so what that means for security in particular, it means not abandoning where you are today. And I think a lot of times for a lot of customers, the, the concept of newer architectures, right? Whether it's zero trust or SASE means starting from scratch. And, and I think that that is the wrong way to look at it. And back to what you just said, it's the evolution of it. And so for, for me, I always start with customers where and how do you want your users to access your data? And I mentioned previously that we've fallen down here uh, in, in years past in the security industry. And you'll, be, you'll probably recognize the term shadow IT. Shadow IT came to pass because we lost sight of experience. Users in an organization decide they're going to take it upon themselves and they're going to build out the tools that they need. That left a tons of holes and discrepancy in policy. And so for me, I always tell and advise customers what is the experience you want, step one. Two, don't abandon where you are today to evolve to that utopia. <laughs> and then wherever you, you, you're, you're envisioning your organization to go. And then three, don't assume 
because a vendor has packaged something nicely and puts a lot of marketing budget behind it that it's going to meet where you need to go. So I think for me, it's just all about evolution and experience of evolution. Yeah, I like that you mentioned that. And by the way, just thinking back to that shadow IT narrative, it's so true. I mean, my gosh, how did the iPhone become one of the predominant devices in the enterprise? And it sort of ended up displacing BlackBerry. You know, the BlackBerry from an enterprise standpoint meant a lot more of what the CIOs and the IT leaders at the time wanted from both a security yeah. and a technology standpoint. But the users, you know, we always used to sort of joke, started off with like the CEO coming in, like, hey, I got this new thing, slapping it down on the IT person's desk and saying, figure out how to make this work with the business, right? And that was kind of a great example of how new designs and architectures were finding their way into the company because it was what execs and what people were using because they enjoyed it more, the experience probably felt more productive. But yes. then again, there were, you know, there were people out there saying, no one's ever going to type on a touch screen. Oh my gosh, I still remember that. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think there was a CEO that said that at one point. I won't, I won't say any names, but let's just say sometimes we pretend to be futurists, but we get it all wrong. So <laughs> Shadow ID has definitely been a great example. By the way, it's also had a massive number of security implications, Samantha. Like, hundred, yeah, hundreds. We opened, we opened so many doors and risks because it's not just phones, it's PCs, laptops, people's home computers. Um, all kinds of different devices that get introduced to networks that never were designed to meet policy within an organization's security strategy. So, you know, I think you started kind of alluding to this a little bit, but talk through. So, you know, you, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, at a, at a high level is don't throw out, you know, kind of throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? Don't just blow up what you're doing and say, okay, we're going to cloud and we're just, you know, but kind of, as you go through this, you know, you mentioned that there's like three considerations to, to, to move to the cloud securely, you know, kind of what's that process look like? How do you walk them through to make sure that they balance on-prem cloud and that they make sure that they're able to keep security in place as they do evolve to meet what's going to be expected in the future? Yeah, so great question. I will encourage everybody to take a step back and realize what are you trying to do? You're trying to... Uh, identify and secure the data. It all starts with data and it start, the second is access. It doesn't matter the architecture that you are evolving to if you lose sight of those two points. And so from a data standpoint, the cloud just means better access, to put it simply. The reason everybody is, is leaning into cloud is because it brings the data to your users in the best possible experience, at least that's the goal. And so access wise, you can't lose sight of all the micro perimeters that you've established in a zero trust data center architecture, which we've spoke, spoken about for years as, as an industry. And so when you kind of evolve to a cloud-based architecture, whether it's multi-cloud, it's specific to mobility around SASE, you want to make sure that the data is intact, the, the integrity of the data remains intact, and the access to that data doesn't get um, compromised. And, and I don't mean compromised from an outside entity. I just mean that you are suddenly opening the door to that data that you otherwise had, had securely had in place. So for me, it's about building the bridge to what you have today in the data center to where you want to go for your mobile users. And that's really what we've been doing at Juniper. We launched last summer uh, Security Director Cloud, and it's been really effective for a lot of our customers and gained a lot of interest from our CISOs and, and CIOs that I personally have been talking to in that it allows for you to manage your zero trust architectures and create those micro per perimeters around the data and, and really these, these centers of data that you have scattered perhaps all over the world. But then it also evolves it to a mobility-based architecture that SASE has the, the goals of fulfilling. Right, So when you have a mobile workforce, you have branch offices, you have locations of your users also globally uh, dispersed, that you're able to bridge those two. The problem that organizations run into is that they bifurcate policy, they, they eliminate and obstruct their visibility. 
And the way you, you eliminate that, the way you maintain a complete 360 of your organization, the way you maintain the build and evolve the policies you've already established is by leveraging the capabilities and all the work that the teams have put into place. And so Security Director Cloud for us has really been that anchor point for customers. So they've had the zero trust architectures, the, 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 the micro uh, segmentation based um, kind of uh, projects in place. And then they've been able to extend that to all their mobility users. They're not having to create two separate sets of policies. They're not having to create two separate systems. Yeah, then that's a that's a pretty sizable challenge. And also, like you said, you know, with so many concurrent migrations taking place, because it's not like, you know, security is almost like a layer that has to move precisely along the line of all the other architectural changes that go on within an organization. And companies right now are implementing, you know, they're changing network fabrics, they're building edge architectures, they're bringing in a mass of data. You know, what did I read? Something like the edge is like a hundred times or some exponential number larger than data center. And so that's a whole nother, you know, you see, we're going to talk about SASE in a minute, but that's a whole nother area that has to be secure. Um, you've got, you know, the, you know, migration to next generation networks. You guys do a ton with telco and that's a big part of the service providers. They've got, you know, upgrades going out, you know, consistently and they're material. These are large up upgrades with very structural differences from say 4G to 5G. The structure is going to be significantly different. Um, you know, we kind of talk about cloud, but now it's not even just cloud, it's multi clouds. It's yep. multiple clouds that tend to have different requirements, architectures, you've got, you know, you've got whether it's a container strategy or you've got certain applications running cloud native, some running on container, some running on premises. So all these things add a ton of complexity and security has to be able to build policies to manage all these different accesses to the data, which by the way, it, it can be stored in all these places, you know, depending on how close the data needs to be to the application, the data can be replicated and duplicated and stored to make sure the applications are working efficiently. So it creates a ton of complexity. Um, but I want to talk a little bit here. I want to sort of wrap up talking about SAS because mm -hmm. you, that's been a big topic. You and I have talked about this in the past. It's still early innings though. It's gaining momentum. It's, you know, it's, it's growing. Um, you're probably having a lot of conversations like what do we need to think about when we start yeah going a SASE architecture. So let's, you know, answer me that, Samantha. What are the questions that CISOs and CIOs that are getting it right in, from what you're seeing, or what are the questions they're asking to make sure they're able to take advantage of the power of SASE architecture? Well, I think the, what is the, the biggest conversation I'm having is to try and eliminate confusion. Because I think, you know, a lot of CISOs are seeing a reference architecture that they think, you know, am I having to start from scratch? And the short answer is no, you shouldn't. And if that is the recommendation, then I would reevaluate. Because what it really is, is, is an extension and it should be an extension of what you already have in place. And that's what we have been really guiding our customers. So all of our customers that have SRX firewall, as an example, whether it's containerized, virtual, uh, physical, or now our SaaS delivered uh, firewall as a service, all should be able to be managed in the same way. And, and the only difference between what we're seeing in, in the kind of early innings of SASE to what is, is, is being proposed architecturally is a delivery change. Instead of delivering the service on premise or virtual, you're delivering it as a service. So I always ask the question, why does your management have to change? Why does your policy structure have to change? If, if, you're be, if it's being proposed to you that in order to implement SASE, that you need to have a completely different set of policies, a completely different vendor, and a completely different uh, way of architecting, then I question that, that that is actually going to serve you long-term. Because to what we were just talking about with Shadow IT at, at the start, that's just gonna open up holes within your network. So we've really been um, working with our customers on leveraging their existing policies, having a single software stack, 
that can evolve with wherever the data resides and wherever the access may be. If it's from your, your mobile phone, if it's sitting from a branch office, if it's sitting at the corporate HQ, it's the same. But the thing that's most important, in addition to the manageability piece, the second most important thing is efficacy. I think a lot of times we lose sight uh, as an industry that a compromise is a compromise, right? And it doesn't matter where you're accessing from. If you're not putting in a solution that has the best efficacy in the market for you to protect you, then it's really not going to um, be very helpful. So most people don't realize that Juniper has been number one in security effectiveness amongst every single firewall and network security vendor in the market for the past three years. And so we couple that with our security director cloud to be able to bridge that transition to strategy and connecting all their investments in zero trust data center architectures with their mobility uh, goals has really just been, um, you know, really exciting and, and really uh, been, been generating a lot of interest. I'm catching a little bit of a theme here, by the way, of don't, you know, basically reinvent what can be innovated upon, right? You've kind of said that in the beginning when we started, you know, don't blow up everything you've done and let's talk about how to evolve. And it sounds like with Sassy, it's very much the same as that some of the customers that you're dealing with may be being kind of told that, hey, in order to make this work, you're going to have to kind of rewrite history, proverbially speaking. And yeah. you're basically saying that's not how it has to be. This can be done in an evolutionary format that can be that can take advantage of what's been done well. And in many cases, organizations have put a lot of time, effort and energy into protecting their current estate. And doing so could be gradually implemented, iterated upon and innovated upon in a way that could be less painful as well, right? Less, co less costly, less painful, uh, shorter time horizon. Uh, so there could be a lot of benefits. Absolutely. Well said. And I would say one of the things in this approach that we're taking is we're reducing operational overhead and costs for our customers. Because if you are having to stand up a completely different architecture with a completely different set of technologies, you're having to invest in individuals within your organization that have to learn it. And, and there's a learning curve associated, there's a cost associated when learning new, new technology. And so we're eliminating that cost. It's an evolution, as we said at the beginning, it's not a, a, a start from scratch or an, an added investment on, on top of everything else. Um, the other thing I will say is you have to factor in um, to the fact that there is going to be mistakes made. And so taking this stepwise approach is giving people the chance to evolve at their pace as, that aligns to their goals. I mean, I say this a lot it, it, to my teams and in meetings, we have erasers on pencils. We're gonna make some errors. So the way to minimize that error is to start with what you have, evolve it, and then build from there. I think that's a great way to end it here, Samantha. I want to say thank you so much for spending some time. I think this migration is going to be challenging. It's going to be also a great opportunity for companies to start to get ahead. And again, this is always a race, always a race between getting ahead and staying ahead because those that are trying to get at your data are increasingly sophisticated, you know, and, and as CIOs, CISOs and leaders, it's going to be more important than ever that you're building an estate of data that can be trusted and protected because it's not just about the security. It's about the reputation that it can cause for your business. So great conversation. I don't think we can talk about security enough ever. <laughs> but I look forward to having these conversations again with you in the future. I've got to say goodbye. Goodbye for now. So thanks for joining me at this year's summit, though. We'll see you again soon. Thank you so much.